So again, today is our pledge dedication Sunday, a bit more on that in a little bit, the conclusion of our annual season of stewardship. And so I want to begin this morning with uh, with a question for you. In your minds, as individuals, as the church, what is it that we are called to be stewards of? Just take a moment. What comes to your mind? What is it that we are called to be stewards of? Again, in your own life, for us as a church, what is the first thing or a couple of things that come to mind? And I want you to hold that thought. We're going to come back to it in a little bit. We've focused our theme for this stewardship season this year on the image of becoming a school of love. Of all the things that scripture says, I think one in particular is the clearest. God is love. First John says it explicitly. We read that a few weeks ago. And the rest of scripture really is story after story of playing this out. What does that look like? Who does it extend to? What does it do? If you want to know what love looks like ultimately for us, we say, look to the life of Jesus, to the way that he lived. And if you want to know in your own life what God looks like, look at those people, those places, those moments that are shot through with love. That is where God is. Love is is the key to understanding scripture, to deconstructing and reconstructing our ideas of of God. It's the key to faith. As Jesus says in John 15, just after this morning scripture reading, as I have loved you, so you must love one another. It sounds nice, right? But, But still, I've heard the question asked, Can we really love like Jesus did, though? Perhaps you've wondered this yourself. Is that really possible? And there is an entire brand of theology that is based really on this question. And the answer, of course, is no. We can never love as powerfully, as fully as Jesus. And as a result, in this particular brand of theology, which is not the entirety of Christianity or theology, but in this brand... This answer, no, you cannot love as fully as Jesus. The emphasis, therefore, becomes God's grace. You can't earn your way to God. And so, therefore, if you just believe that Jesus was perfect, that he died for your sins, for all the ways that you failed to measure up and fully live out this love, if you believe that Jesus did it, even though you can't, then you get to go to heaven. But the thing is... While you believe this, you can believe this and still be a good person, in my experience, what it oftentimes actually serves as is a useful way of not having to wrestle with what I think Jesus actually does make clear. Namely, that he expects more of those who claim to follow him than we are often willing to give. We want to think perhaps that maybe an hour on Sundays or attending a Bible study or putting a few bucks in an offering plate makes us Christian, right? We we want to be good, but like, aren't we good enough already? Like, we shouldn't make people feel bad, right? So we reduce what Jesus calls us to as sort of a morality list, right? Okay, love looks like being polite, Respecting your elders, no swearing, no drinking, no dancing. Right, you get the point. This is what it looks like to be good, and this is good enough. That's what love is. But do we really have to love our enemies and pray for those who persecute us? I mean, Jesus can't really mean that, can he? Nah. Right, the emphasis on not being able to love like Jesus allows us to dismiss him or explain away why he doesn't really mean for us to respond to violence with nonviolence when he tells us to turn the other cheek. It allows us to convince ourselves that it's, it's enough to not be as bad as those people over there. We all know who those people are, right? As long as we vote a certain way or, or, or again, make a, a, a nice donation to a nonprofit here or there, that, that, that's enough, right? That's, that's good. 
Surely Jesus doesn't mean it when he says that how we treat those in our world who have been made last and least, those who are in prison, those who are hungry, those who are having bombs dropped on their heads, surely Jesus doesn't mean how we treat them is how we treat him. I mean, that's not very realistic. Let's be honest. Surely he's not calling us to actually bear one another's burdens, as scripture says, or to redistribute our money and resources to build greater equity, as scripture says, or to practice radical forgiveness and accountability and continued growth. Surely, even though scripture says all of those things, that's, that, he can't really mean that, can he? Like, that's, that's a bit of a tall order. I've noticed that we can easily come up with all kinds of excuses and justifications for why Jesus' words are impractical, or they don't apply to this situation or that issue or those people. We're pretty good at coming up with excuses and justifications. But here's the thing. I think the question, can we love like Jesus? Can we really do that? I think it's actually a distraction. Because the thing is, we are not called to be Jesus. You are not the savior of the world. I am not the savior of the world. Christians, and especially white Christians, have for too long seen ourselves as saviors of those helpless people over there. And it's done a lot of damage. Your job, our job, is not to save anyone. That said, I think that Jesus meant what he said when he told his disciples, as I have loved you, so you must love one another. I think he means it when he says that. When he says time and time again that this is how people will know that you are my followers. Right? You should love so boldly, so courageously, so counterculturally that people notice. But they ask, what's gotten into these people? I think he's serious when he says, as he does in this morning's reading from the Gospel of John, that in looking to him, that vision of love that he embodies, if we can fix our gaze here, if we can trust it, even when it seems impossible, then I assure you, he says, I assure you that you will do what I am doing. And in fact, you will do even greater things than what I am doing. That is, don't, don't try to be me. That's not your calling. But don't settle for less than what I am calling you to. Now, I understand the anxiety of being called to step into something that, that asks a lot of you, right? This is a pretty tall order, right? The fear of not being able to do it, of not measuring up. Perhaps you can think of a time in your own life when you were called to step into something you felt entirely un or under prepared for, right? That's exactly where Jesus' disciples find themselves in this morning's reading from the Gospel of John. In the verses we read, again, in those chapters surrounding as Jesus is preparing to, to leave them, preparing them to carry on, to continue imagining and living out the same life-raising, world-altering mission of love that they've experienced in him, right? Jesus' disciples aren't ready to imagine this. How... They, they have all kinds of questions and perhaps in some ways excuses, right? How are we supposed to know what to do or how to do it when you're gone? What this love looks like? This is your job, right? You're really leaving us? Where are you going? To which Jesus effectively responds, guys, friends, we have been together day in and day out You've been coming here Sunday after Sunday for how long? And you still don't understand? You know the way forward. 
You've seen it in me. You've walked it alongside me. The only thing left for you to do is to stop passively watching me, worshiping me, and for you to step into that love yourself. No more excuses. That is the invitation for us. This is what we are called to, at the end of the day, to be stewards of in every generation, the way of love. Now, how many of you, when I asked earlier what you imagine yourself or us as the church, what it is that we are called to be stewards of, how many of you, the first thought that came into your mind, I won't make you raise your hand, but how many of you thought building or finances or, or some sort of concrete thing, right? Perhaps even a program. That this, this is what we steward and pass on to the next generation, whether in our own lives, in our own families, as a church. Now, while these material things are certainly not unimportant, and we give great thanks for those who have gone before us who have left us with this building, right? and such. But that is not what we are primarily called to be stewards of. As followers of Jesus, that is why we are here, somehow to seek to follow after this way of Jesus. To be, we are called to be stewards of the way of love that he shows us, that he, he also calls us to embody for the healing and repair of of well, of our own broken but beautiful lives for our beautiful but broken world, right? For now, we have a building. But the church can exist without a building, or at least without owning one. Maybe someday we won't have a building. Who knows? Such things are tools in the service of our true mission, which is love. We can steward love without a building, but if we focus all of our time and energy on stewarding a building and not primarily on love, I, well, you can effectively say that we are no longer a church. We are no longer following Jesus, if that's the case. Now, to be clear, in all of this, I am not saying that we are called to be perfect. Or again, to be Jesus. Loving like Jesus is not about never making mistakes. We don't have to be afraid of failure or of not measuring up or of, of getting it wrong because, let's be honest, we will. We will get it wrong because we're human. Our loved ones who we carry into the space got it wrong from time to time because they were human. To love like Jesus is to commit ourselves to an intentional journey. It's to hold fast to our values, to, to a robust vision of love, practices of love, even when our bodies want to go into fight or flight, even when we don't want to do that hard work, even when we're angry or we disagree, even when we've already screwed it up. The invitation, the challenge, is to stay committed to this way in a world that is continually trying to pull us off track. Which is why I think it's important to have a school of love. Right? We, learn, we, we learn so many other things in life, practical things, how to do things, jobs, but where do we really learn how to love throughout the course of our lives? To keep learning, unlearning, relearning? Because again, so much of what our world tells us is love, what it calls love, is not, I would say, actually love. So much of what our families modeled for us, perhaps, was not actually love. So much of what I know a number of you have experienced in previous churches before, is not actually love. Right? That like our understanding of God, 
our understanding of love needs to be continually deconstructed and reconstructed and deepened and expanded throughout the course of our lives. And we have to do that with intentionality. Right? If we are to heal ourselves, to heal our world, again, where, where else in the world can we go to do that? To do that work? To keep doing that learning? Where else, if not together as those seeking to follow the way of Jesus? I think like in our own lives, like in our own families, it's much easier to focus on ensuring that the next generation just gets that, that concrete material thing, the house, some money, those, all those things that we think they're going to want, that they'll put into a closet and never look at again, but that's what we pass on, right? That's what we're stewarding. It's so much easier to focus on this. But again, let me ask you, as we gather on this All Saints Day, as we remember those whose names were spoken, those you carry here, the pictures in front of us, when you think of these people and what they mean to you, how they continue to light the way forward, continue to come to you and speak into your life, is the reason that you brought them into this space because of some objects they passed on to you? I mean, perhaps they did, but was it not perhaps because of the love that they offered you? Was that not the primary reason that they are still so closely bound to you? The love that they shared with the world? Is love not the legacy that we seek to leave behind? is building a movement of love, not what we are inviting people into as a church. Like Jesus' disciples, I, I understand. I understand why we want to cling to something concrete. But I also know that what our world really needs, what each of us really needs, what we are really called to, is committing ourselves wholly and fully to the lifelong journey of growing in love and to the actions that follow from it. I truly believe that a small community like ours can actually have an outsized impact on the world around us. And I know that might sound grandiose, this idea of us becoming a school of love and, and changing the world around us. What difference can we really make, perhaps you might be thinking. To which I would offer this very biblical response from the 20th century anthropologist Margaret Mead, who said, never doubt, never doubt that a small group of thoughtful, committed individuals can change the world. In fact, it's the only thing that ever has. With the author of Ephesians, may our own prayer be that the love of Jesus would so fill us and flow through us so that grounded and rooted in this love, nurtured and sustained by it, we too may experience the power of God to do far, far, far more than we may even dare to ask or imagine. May it be so of us. Amen.